The word lesbian is associated with the name of the Greek island of Lesbos, where the poet Sappho lived, whose poems were often mistaken for glorifying same-sex love. This will also be discussed in the video. There were many rumors surrounding the personal life of the daughter of King Gustav II of Sweden and Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg. Historian Lillian Fetterman writes that such contemporaries of Christina as the Count Palatine, the Duke of Guise and Mademoiselle Montpensier, one way or another, confirmed her indifference to women. Especially intriguing are the passionate letters she wrote during the trip to a certain Ebi Spara. If you have not forgotten what power you had over me, you should also remember that I was at the mercy of your love for twelve years. I am all yours so much that you will never dare to leave, and this all that my death will do is stop my love for you. Although it was the usual language of romantic friendship at the time, many commentators saw an explicit and repetitive sexual context in Christina's relationships with women. In 1719, 30 years after her death, the Countess Palatine, the mother of the Prince of Orleans, wrote in her memoirs that Christina once tried to take possession of Madame de Brigny by force, who barely managed to fend her off. Queen Christina's contemporaries confirmed her indifference to women. The famous sexologist of the 19th century Havelock Ellis wrote, her pronounced masculine mannerisms combined with high intelligence were combined, apparently, with an obviously homosexual or bisexual temperament. In the last years of her life, Christina maintained a close relationship with Cardinal Azzolini, and it was rumored that they were lovers. When she died on April 19, 1689, Cardinal Azzolini became her official heir. The image of Christina is immortalized by Greta Garbo in the famous 1933 film, Queen Christina, where she portrays her with racy sexual ambiguity. The last representative of the Stuart dynasty on the English throne, Queen Anne, was a narrow-minded woman, kind and friendly, but not very understanding, indecisive, and not loving to do business hard. In fact, all power was concentrated in the hands of her faithful advisor Sarah Churchill, née Jennings, whom Anna met in 1670. However, in 1707, the relationship between the friends deteriorated greatly. Abigail Massam, Sarah's cousin, took the place of the main favorite. In July 1708, a poem fell into Mrs. Massam's hands, Churchill, which hinted at a lesbian relationship between the Queen and her new advisor. Sarah wrote to Anna that her reputation had been seriously damaged by a great passion for such a woman, strange and incomprehensible. Queen Anne was in an intimate relationship with her maid, What's it? Jealousy? Perhaps? According to the biographers of the English Queen, Abigail was for Anna just a devoted servant who adhered to traditional mores and was completely faithful to her husband. Among the first famous Russian lesbians, historians reasonably named Catherine II's famous friend, Princess Ekaterina Dashkova. Having married early and remained a widow with two children, the well-educated, courageous princess appeared at public meetings in a man's dress, jokingly saying that nature mistakenly put a man's heart into her. Unlike her crowned friend, Dashkova had no favorites. Her only attachment was a young companion, Martha Wilmot, discharged from England, whom the miserly princess showered with generous gifts and tried to make her heir. According to some reports, even a half-joking duel challenge that Dashkova sent to her rival, English cousin Martha Maria Wilmot, has been preserved. Miss Wilmot's return to England in 1808 plunged Dashkova into despair. One by one, she sent the most affectionate messages to England. Here are some typical expressions of them. Forgive me, my soul, my friend, Masha, your Dashkova kisses you, my friend, my soul, forgive me, be healthy, my love, and I love you more than life, and I will love you to death, my dear child. After Marta's departure, Dashkova lived for a little over a year. Princess Vera Gidroik, a Russian surgeon, poet, and writer, one of the world's first female professors of surgery and one of the first women to head a surgical department, lived and was inspired by a love for women. According to the memoirs of her contemporaries, the princess was in many ways courageous, and she was often called Sappho and George Sand of Tsarska Selo. She had a tough character but was distinguished by respect and attention to others and sincerely cared for the sick. Gidroik's first known favorite woman was Ricky Goody, whom Vera met while studying in Lausanne. They wanted to return to Russia together, but due to a number of circumstances, it was impossible. The second great love of the princess was Countess Maria Nyrid, with whom they spent the last 14 years of the life of a heroic female surgeon in Kiev. Vera Gidruk died of cancer in 1932. Eleanor Roosevelt went down in history as a public and political figure, author of books, publicist, 
diplomat, and first lady. But she was an unusual first lady, just as her husband Franklin Delano Roosevelt was no ordinary president. Eleanor often repeated that she had no desire to have sex with her husband and that marital duty was a torment for her. In 1978, it became known about the letters of the late journalist Lorena Hickok, from which it can be understood that she was a close friend of the First Lady. Lorena Hickok, a rather plump woman of masculine appearance, met Eleanor in 1932, on the day of the presidential election. Hickey, as Eleanor affectionately called her, even had her own room in the White House, but quite often she slept in Mrs. Roosevelt's bedroom. The office staff confirms that in the morning Lorena could be found sleeping on her friend's couch. They traveled a lot together and were always without guards. Hickey often received gifts from Eleanor, including even a car. Franklin Roosevelt obviously suspected something because he did not like the woman and one day he demanded that she be removed from the White House. Eleanor refused. In March 1933, on their wedding anniversary, Hickey gave Eleanor sapphire ring. The first lady rarely wore jewelry, but she hardly took off this ring. In one of the letters she wrote to Hickey, My beloved, I want to hug you and hold you tight. Your ring brings me relief. When I look at it, I think you love me, otherwise I wouldn't be wearing it. Over the 30 years of their acquaintance, Eleanor wrote Hickey more than 2,300 letters, many of which were full of feelings. At Lorena's request, after her death, they were made public and included in her biography, written by Doris Faber and published in 1980. In one of her letters there are the words, I can't kiss you, so when I fall asleep and wake up, I kiss your photos. Lorena Hickok was a talented journalist, but gave up her career to be able to work with Eleanor Roosevelt. After Franklin Roosevelt's death, their relationship deteriorated. They lived together for only one year. In ancient Greece, sexual relations between men were acceptable, but such relationships between women were forbidden, especially in Athens. Ancient Greek and Roman authors rarely mention lesbians in their writings, and if they wrote anything about them, it was in a hostile tone. Athenian women had very few rights. They were completely subordinated to their husbands. Men did not even imagine that their women might have any other desires than to please their husbands. In Sparta, everything was somewhat different. Women had more freedom there. This also applies to sexual relations. Lesbian love of Spartans is mentioned in some written sources. An elderly woman had a sexual relationship with a young girl and was her mentor in society. There is a very strange story of Sappho from the island of Lesbos, which historians are still arguing about. Some of them recognize the erotic appeal of women in her poems, while others believe that it is just platonic love between close friends. In fact, rumors about Sappho's homosexuality began to spread only during the Roman Empire. The Greeks in their legends described her as a woman who was unrequited in love with a man and committed suicide because of it. The Greeks spoke ill of her because she was a married woman and dreamt of another man, not another woman. Also in ancient Greece, the inhabitants of Lesbos had a bad reputation in Athens. They were despised for same-sex love. The Athenians believed that they were attracted to each other. Some of you have already heard something about the island of Lesbos where lesbian relationships existed. But was that really the case? Information about this is very limited. Lesbian love is practically not described in the historical written sources that have come down to us. Most books in ancient Greece were written by men who lived far from women, and sources written by women have not been preserved. However, historians know about the ancient Greek writer Sappho of Lesbia, who lived in about 630, 570 BC. Several of her works have been preserved. One of them is the poem, Ode to Aphrodite. It has come down to our days in full. Only fragments of her other works have been preserved. Most of our knowledge about ancient Greece comes from sources written in the city-state of Athens. But if we are talking about the homosexuality of the ancient Greeks, then descriptions of this kind of relationship come from outside Athens. That's why Sappho's work is very important. Her poems are replete with homoerotic images. She writes how her heart flies when she hears her friend's gentle voice. But what to do with all this? Perhaps the poetess wrote these poems not on her own behalf, but on behalf of the heroine Sappho who expressed her lesbian feelings. Or maybe Sappho wrote about her experience. Sappho in verse can be very different from the real Sappho. But leaving aside the question of whether Sappho was describing her personal experiences or speaking on behalf of a character, then in fact her poems give us an idea of female homosexuality in ancient Greece. 
Modern people remember Sappho as a lesbian poet, but in ancient times they had access to a much larger number of her poems than they do today. The ancient Greeks represented Sappho as an icon, not a lesbian or heterosexually promiscuous. Another ancient Greek poet, Alcman, who lived in Sparta in the 7th century BC, wrote a choral song in which the girls vied with each other in praise. This work is full of female homoeroticism, or sexual wordplay is used. And in the symposium, a philosophical dialogue about the nature of love, the ancient Greek philosopher Plato mentioned the attachment of women to each other. Part of the description is presented in the form of a humorous fable about the origin of sexual attraction. According to Aristophanes, there used to be people who had two heads, four arms, and four legs. But some had two penises, others had two vaginas, and still others had both a penis and a vagina. These people were trying to overthrow the gods from Olympus. Then an angry Zeus separated them. Those who had two members each began to feel a craving for their soulmate. The same thing happened to the other separated ones. This desire of the halves to unite into one whole became known as love. Those who had two penises became homosexuals, who had both a penis and a vagina, male and female heterosexuals. Those who had two vaginas became lesbians. All the ancient Greek sources that have come down to us about Greek homosexuality were mostly written not by Greeks, but by heterosexual male writers in later times. Very briefly, the homosexuality of women is mentioned in the Epistle to the Romans, written in Greek by the Jewish Apostle Paul of Tarsus. He describes how God punished people for their humiliating passions. Their women replaced sexual intercourse with men with mutual intercourse. They committed shameless acts and were punished for it. The Roman poet Martial ridiculed the Greek Philonese in his work. He described her as extremely masculine, raping boys and loving sex with girls. As a husband, she slept with more than 11 girls every day. However, Martial was considered a very rude author. Arodi says that if a man can make love to boys, then why not let women do the same with girls? He suggests allowing women to love each other. Arodes uses the word lesbians, which was a rarity for authors of that time. Homosexuality of homosexuals in the ancient world, lesbians were generally treated negatively. Sometimes husbands even killed their wives for homosexual relationships, since female homosexuality was considered taboo.